I'm good at ideas and I don't think hugely valuable unless you have the execution piece tied up. I don't sign NDAs much because most ideas aren't worth anything. So I don't think it's special to have ideas. I think it's special to be able to execute them. Took a lot of the lessons that my father had always imparted upon me and things that made him successful over the years. Treating people right, running a business with empathy and compassion. He has people still in his businesses that have been working for him for almost 30 years. You don't really see that in fast casual concepts, particularly not in New York, unless you're, you're doing something right. I guess I must have some character attributes of building a team, which is what, I guess, from sport. Played everything when I was little. I love sport. Being in the classroom was um, dream time for me. Welcome back to the Fifth Wave podcast. I'm Jeffrey Young, Editor-in-Chief of Coffee Business Magazine, Fifth Wave. And today we're exploring the careers of three very impressive individuals in the business of coffee to learn their stories and the secrets of their success. And they each have three very different approaches to their entrepreneurial careers. We speak with Toby Smith, a pioneer of the Australian coffee scene and founder of Toby's Estate, one of Australia's first and largest specialty coffee roasters. We'll hear from Gregory Sanfotis of Gregory's Coffee, a specialty coffee chain founded in New York City. But we're kicking off with the multifaceted entrepreneur, James Hoffman. James is the co-founder of the iconic London-based Square Mile Coffee Roasters, a YouTuber with millions of monthly viewers, a best-selling author, a former World Barista champion, and so much more. My hour-long conversation with James touched on so many facets of his numerous successes in the coffee industry, and it's impossible to squeeze it all into this episode. So look out for a bonus episode of the whole conversation with James soon. But here today, we're picking out a few learnings from the conversation, clues into how James built his success, and the principles that guide his work. Welcome, James. Thank you for having me. A lot of people know that you're the co-founder, founder, founder, owner of Square Mile Coffee. Mm -hmm. Is that where it all began? Yeah, I think business-wise. 2007, I left my job. I was working as the national training manager for La Spaziale in the UK, sort of driving around all over the UK, working with coffee roasters, coffee suppliers on education and that kind of stuff. And, you know, the 2005 to 2007 was a different time of specialty coffee in the UK. It was kind of just bubbling under the surface. But I got to the point where I sort of felt like I needed to stop telling people what to do to go and do it, you know? And so I quit my job in June 2007. I knew I would compete in the World Birthday Championships in August 2007. I won the Worlds in, in Tokyo, and that was a surprise. And we'd registered a company name without really thinking about it, and I'd filled it in on my form without really thinking about it. And so it was announced that James Hoffman of Square Mile Coffee Roasters had won the World Roasting Championships. And people were like, what is this company? Like no one's, and I'm like, well, it's a sort of paper exercise at this point. But then the global financial crisis happened. It seemed a bad time to sign a cafe unit. So we started roasting coffee and really focused on being a wholesale coffee roaster. Uh, you know, I went into that a passionate coffee person and very quickly realized I had an absence of business knowledge. Uh, and so a lot of my journey personally, the first couple of years of Square Mile was was moving away from being an obsessive coffee person into being someone who could help run a business that made money from coffee. I stopped running Square Mile as a sort of MD six or seven years ago, because that's not my skill set. And there is a much, much more capable set of hands there. And I can be useful to that person. She can call on me for what she needs from me, but you need a different kind of executor in a business of that size. Square Mile's not huge, 25-ish people, you know, like it's uh, big enough that you're sort of spinning plates. And that was never really my skill set, you know, running a thing. And I can do the idea generation or the creative or, or that kind of stuff. And there are then capable people to take that on and I can work with them to sort of deliver an, an idea because that's kind of where I'm best. I'm good at ideas and I don't think hugely valuable unless you have the execution piece tied up. I don't sign NDAs much because most ideas aren't worth anything. So I, I don't think it's special to have ideas. I think it's special to be able to execute them. So you created the blog, the book, the YouTube channel. So what are you thinking about now? I think what I get more interested in now is stuff either on the periphery of coffee or actually outside of coffee at this point. I think coffee is an industry that's very interesting, but it lacks a bit of cross-pollination for me sometimes. And, and where you do see it, I think you see a lot of interesting stuff. I'm not aiming to grow a portfolio of active investments because I don't have the time to deliver anything else beyond you know, a little help, but certainly not enough to 
to demand significant chunks of anything business-wise. But I think the businesses I remain more interested in are helpful rather than sort of just looking to do wealth extraction. You know what I mean? Like I'm not interested in someone who's just trying to build a thing to sell a thing and flip it for 10x. I've met enough billionaires now to have no interest in that. They've all been uniformly miserable people because of course they are. For me, I'm not trying to accrue tens or hundreds of millions. That's just not interesting. Where I would invest, it would be either because they're doing something transformative and interesting and fun or where I stand to learn a ton from my relationship there as well. I have to be careful. I've learned this lesson nearly, nearly learned this lesson, which is there needs to be more no in my life. You know, like it's easy to take on too much stuff. It's easy to overestimate my capacity to make or do or deliver on something. You know, most of the people I disappoint is because I would say, I just, I can't make you a promise I'm not going to keep. So that's kind of my, my kind of uh, situation right now, which is I'm trying to say a lot of no's and very careful yeses. But for me, there needs to be a payback of either delight, learning, or impact. One of the themes I can get, you take a lot on, but you, you seem to be able to let go of things as well. We started Square Mile with this intention of having a cafe and putting a little roaster at the back and having a really great cafe that roasted its own coffee. And we might do a bit of wholesale. And I think if I had been, if we had been rigid about that idea, unable to let it go, that company, that business would have died within a year. Because firstly, we didn't really know what we were doing. Secondly, it was a terrible time to start that kind of a business. London wasn't interested, wasn't ready. Our location wasn't as good as we thought. All of those things. Hindsight, wonderful thing. But at the time, the ability to say, oh, let's just let go of that particular goal. What are we really interested in? You know, one layer deeper. Let's keep doing that. And, and start doing that. And I think there's been a number of occasions with either locations or opportunities where the ability to be flexible, I think, is, is very important. You should have things that you stick to that you're driven by. But I think being rigid and unflexible now is, is you know, the strength of your convictions will go so far. But I think you can easily get stuck trying to do a thing that just isn't going to work. And I see all the time still, I see people try and build businesses where they, they've decided what it's going to be and they don't have that kind of adaptability or flexibility when the world changes around them to respond. What about opportunities you wish you would have spotted? I don't have a brain that thinks that way. I'm very lucky because I can see at the other extreme, it, it cripples people. The, the what ifs of life absolutely cripple people. What if I'd invested? What if I'd bought Tesla at X price or Apple stock at this price, right? Like mm. what if I'd bought 100 Bitcoin 10 years ago? I'd be a millionaire now. And yeah, you would, but you didn't. So just move on. Like I don't have that part of my brain or it's not fully developed anyway, that really has a what if component to it. I think I spent too much time or more time sort of trying to extrapolate out the future that I really don't have much brain space left for the past. Yeah. I think you just set yourself up to be constantly dissatisfied in life because there's always a better decision. There's always a better option. You could have always had more success, more money, more something, but you didn't and you can't do anything about it. So what is the benefit? You can learn from the mistake, but there's no point feeling a negative emotion about it. You may as well feel a positive emotion about what, a better decision in the future. That's how I feel. Thanks so much, James. It's been great having you here at Serendipity Studios. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. For me, James' ability to build teams that help him execute his ideas and the fact that he doesn't get bogged down in regrets were powerful insights. Next up, we're speaking to Gregory Samfotis of Gregory's Coffee, a fast-growing specialty coffee business in and around New York City. Gregory's Coffee brand is distinctive. The logo is a stylized version of Gregory himself wearing his signature glasses. Greg is the son of a Greek immigrant who ran his own deli business in New York. And in this interview, we explore the influence of family in Gregory's success. Welcome, Gregory. Thank you for having me. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of background on Gregory's Coffee. So Gregory's Coffee began in 2006 with a single location in the Flatiron District of Manhattan, New York City. We're a family-run specialty coffee company. We're a roaster. We bake and do all of our food production in-house. We've grown over the years from that single location in Manhattan to, as of now, 31 locations across New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. We're actually opening our 32nd location in about, I don't know, 
42 hours. So that's exciting. Wow. We'll have another location opening this week, five more in 2021, plans for a significant more, around 40 more stores across 22 and 2023. So what got you into coffee? Why coffee? My father owned and operated some fast casual concepts in New York City, but I, I, I went to school for undergraduate business thinking I may, may pursue a degree in, or a career in, in banking. And when I decided to pivot from there, I came to New York City for, for law school and was, thought a corporate attorney was interesting to me. But like most things, I, I realized my, my extensive history working with my father and in the food business and creating things with my hands, I, I couldn't get enough of this and decided I wanted to open my own business. So what happened next? I was running one of my father's delis at the time. So he used to come and see me and discuss whether it was school or, or the business or life. And our go-to destination was Starbucks. And being in the food business, you can't help when you enter another shop or another business of sort of identifying what you like, what you don't like, what you would do differently, what you appreciate. I think after a number of those conversations of saying what I appreciated about that Starbucks experience and what I would do differently if it was something of my own, that was sort of that aha moment. I was like, you know, there's enough that I see that I would do slightly differently than what Starbucks is doing. This is, you know, 2004, 2005, that maybe this is my opportunity. So what was the gap in the market that you wanted to address? Places weren't really geared up for speed. They weren't really geared up for convenience. And as time has gone on, many of them didn't or took a lot longer than others to develop, whether it was mobile payment apps or order ahead or some of the things that now are sort of a necessity for most businesses. And if you looked at the map of specialty coffee in the early 2000s, there really wasn't very many options for great coffee in sort of the fairway of, of New York City, you know, downtown financial district, midtown. You could find great coffee, but you had to go to Brooklyn or sort of the, the edges of town. So I think most people would agree Starbucks stores are tend to be very busy. So they're great at pushing plenty of people through their lines and a lot of convenience, uh, a lot of consistency. Then there's plenty of places where you could get a great cup of coffee. This was particularly the case years ago where, you know, if you really wanted a great cup of coffee, something a little bit more elevated maybe than what you would experience at a Starbucks, you'd expect to wait a little bit longer. So we developed the idea of how can I take all the convenience, the consistency, the speed, the efficiencies that you find at these Starbucks locations with the quality, the innovation, and sort of that elevated experience that you would find at some of the smaller, more boutique coffee shops. Mm -hmm. Doing those things together is very challenging, but when you do it really well, it's something that's quite special and the guests really appreciate it. You know, we call our guests Gregulars. What do you feel is the significance of Gregory's Coffee's roots as a family business? You know, how does that influence the way you operate? You know, watching my father run his concepts over the years showed me a lot, sort of like that Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. When I had started Gregory's, I was young. I was 23, 24 years old, but I had been doing this, I felt like my entire life. And then moving forward, took a lot of the lessons that my father had always imparted upon me and things that made him successful over the years, treating people right, running a business with empathy and compassion. You know, he has people still in his businesses that have been working for him for almost 30 years. You know, you don't really see that in fast, casual concepts, particularly not in New York, unless you're, you're doing something right. What would you say are the greatest business lessons that you've learned from your father that you've applied to Gregory's? He always was the hardest working guy in the room, sort of that Larry Bird. He was always the first guy there, the last one to leave and sort of instilled this work ethic in me on how to never give up. Don't ever quit until you're successful. You know, he was the guy, if I got a 98 on a math test, he'd ask me what I got wrong. And at the <laughs> time I would always bristle, you know, why can't you just be proud of the fact that I got an A plus? And he'd be like, well, I want to know what you got wrong. You know, it's all about don't stop, don't quit, and don't don't just be resting on your laurels or expect. There's nothing is, I think his whole thing is that nothing should be taken for granted. And just because you've you've been successful recently or you've done a good job, that doesn't guarantee success at the next turn. He's always said, don't leave anything to chance. Anything that you can you can control, you should. And if there's anything left, you know, you you need to work your your butt off to make sure that you're covering all those bases and and all those sorts of things. What are some of the mistakes you've made along the way that you've now learned from? Some of the biggest mistakes I've made is not knowing when to ask for help. I am very confident and sometimes overconfident in myself. And I think 
there have been periods of time where I've bitten off more than I can chew. And a lot of it came with some of our periods of growth and not having the proper support system around me and the company. And I had like 18 stores. I didn't have a district manager or anybody on operations. It was, it was just me and one or two other people building out five to 10 stores a year while also overseeing this operation across you know multiple states. And it all seemed like doable at the time. And then when I got in and I was like, wow, this is, I'm trying to update menus and roll out new products and continue buying great coffees and roasting it to a really high degree and opening stores and all the complexities of trying to open a store in a new district and learning what the buildings department in Washington, D.C. expects compared to New York City. I mean, there was a lot of things that were happening that I couldn't have predicted. And in, in retrospect, if I had prepared ahead of time by having a few more people in certain places, it would have helped. And we have a lot of those people now, which is just giving me supreme confidence to do a lot. Just kind of, again, learning from those mistakes and not making them again. So what are you most proud of in you know the business you've built? I'm sort of like the, the conductor of this, this symphony here where I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of energy and a lot of motivations to do great things. But Surrounding myself with great people, talented people, smart people, hardworking has helped me or empowered me to feel like I could do so much more than I ever thought. So couldn't be prouder of my team. And it's one of the, the most exciting things for me is coming to work every day and getting to share coffee with these people and watching amazing things happen every day with them. That's been amazing, Greg. Thanks so much for being here on Fifth Wave today. Thank you for having me. I loved how Gregory took his father's core principles, treating people well and lots of hard work, and extended it into his own business. Finally, we're ending this episode by speaking with Toby Smith, an unrelenting entrepreneur and founder of Toby's State, one of Australia's first and largest specialty coffee roasters. The interview was recorded in Australia on a windy veranda, so I've re-recorded my parts in Serendipity Studios so you can follow the conversation better. I'm delighted to be here today with Toby Smith. We're sitting on his estate in the lovely town of Bellingen. Welcome, Toby. Thanks, Jeff. Could you give us some background to Toby's estate, the business that you created? 20-odd years ago now, I was really interested in coffee. There wasn't a lot of schools to learn. There weren't certifications. So I went off to Brazil, not knowing what I was setting out to do, but I just wanted to learn more about coffee. In northern New South Wales, in my 20s, I spotted a coffee tree and I went, oh, wow, is that how you make coffee from a tree, the fruit, and then it dries, and that's the seed, which is the bean, the cherry, you know. When I got to Brazil, I did a tasting cupping course, and I sort of noticed that I, I could identify really quickly defects and faults and flavour notes and profiles. So that's what really interested me, you know, roasting flavour coffee. So I, after staying there for several months, I came back and, you know, spotted the opportunity, what was there that could be done with coffee in Australia and so I researched and studied, particularly the States, and seen that they'd started the Specialty Coffee Association. And there were barista competitions and where Australia wasn't at in that regard with marketing to coffee. So I guess, yeah, that was my entrepreneurial mindset of, of, of what I could do and building a business. Then it was a very modest start. I did it in the old, you know, the, the good old story of starting in the garage, which is all true. So I had a bigger vision to where I wanted the business to go, which then took me on to the next ride of, of partnering with a corporation to expand the business globally. So we started in Singapore. We soon then went to uh, New York and then Philippines, and then Indonesia and Kuwait. So what do you think you got right as a leader when building the business? There's always a risk. Getting a partner a start is at the right time, is the right time. I think we, we were very fortunate to come along um, and start the business at the time we did. And we were very fortunate with some of the staff we had and, and, and the good culture that was built there. And, and, um, and the moves you make, you can't get it always right. You do make mistakes. And I had made many before. So it wasn't, it was a matter of, look, this is what I feel in my gut now with a business. To, when, when do you sell? Who knows the best time? Should you hold or not? It, you know, and, and given that we had a good mutual vision um, in those early days, we did expand and prosper quite well. And, well, as we've seen, we've got licensees in several countries and things are tracking quite well with it. What are the key traits of a successful entrepreneur? It's easy for me to take steps and leap into things more so than others, I guess, and take risks and be happy with mistakes and know that I'm, you know, I do strive 
for perfection. I'm a Virgo, but I'm also the opposite of a Virgo a lot of the times. I think maybe the combination of those two, if I were to get my stars read, may have uh, helped. And, uh, you know, stamina, energy and and belief, whether that's uh, naivety or not, it could be said, I don't know. As we always say, when you look, would you do it again? Be like, oh, God, if I knew what I knew now, probably not. But I don't know, the advent- and, and adventure, adventurous, you know, like and that willingness to make a plan and know that it's not going to come exactly as planned but be able to move the next day if you and identify where your thinking was wrong. I think that played a good part of it in being able to sort of keep ahead of the game. I guess I must have some character attributes of building a team, which is what I guess from sport, I love sport. Being in the classroom was um, just dream time for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I guess I was a, frequently nominated the captain. And so maybe I got some leadership skills there. But, you know, I think there's, you know, similarities, business, you know, leadership qualities and also set, you know, by example and, and doing it yourself and, you know, mucking in and doing the dishes if you have to or cleaning the floor if you have to. I mean, yeah. that's also by necessity that, you know, you have to do it at two o'clock in the morning because there's no one else to do it. So you've gone on to operate your own coffee farm in Panama. Tell us about that. Why would you get a, you, you live in Australia, why would you yeah, venture into a farm in Panama? But I guess it was just sort of, again, that, you know, quest for where do I go next with coffee? What's the next challenge? I mean, the agricultural side and the processing was one of the things that really, really interested me because it was just such an unknown then, the effects on individual, you know, regions and countries and how they were being processed. What did you learn from having a coffee farm that you may not have appreciated earlier in your coffee career? Well, picking coffee for a start, it's hard going. The first thing I always really appreciated, even in the early days, was, you know, coffee wastage. You know, as baristas... Just grinding, get everything right in the espresso machine and calibrating and you just see how much wastage goes down the drain and all that hand-picking that's been done. It's just since the value in hand-picked coffee and how much care farmers go through it, it really is, you know, each bean is a, is a nugget of gold, really. And what about your new venture, the Varia Brewer that you're helping to bring to market? Toby's approached me with, with an idea of a multi-brewer. I think that you've got espresso machines, as we know, are really difficult to run in a home environment. And it really does produce espresso, long black and milk-based products. Then, you, of course, you've got filter, plunger and mocha pop. But we just refined it so you can use all of those by changing a few parts, all of those methods at home, really reasonably priced, not espresso machine cost. People know how to use one or the other. But what it does is show you what a different types of brew with a different type of grind, those variables, you can achieve quite a lot at home with this bit of kit. And because it all works together, it's sort of the idea is that to open you up to those possibilities. And you also won an SEA Best Product Award. Tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah, we were so happy about that. Hats off to Ramsey. He's the designer, by the way. I'm the, I'm the, yeah, the, the support entrepreneur on the side. He's the designer. I, 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 I throw in some ideas, but anyway, it just, uh, just helps with, um, getting the product out there. Yeah, we've been at it for six years. But look, it's, it's rewarding. You know, noth- nothing's easy, yeah. and you can't expect it to be. And if you a perfectionist, you want to get it right. Ramsey really is, uh, puts a lot of time in it. Then it's um. That's going to happen. And uh, so we hope we reap the rewards. So tell us about some of your influences in business. Okay, firstly, it's family, of course. Your mum and dad bring you up and, uh, and an extended family. I've got my sister Jo and mum and dad. Um, my mother had a cafe and dad's a real entrepreneur and into business and a good sounding board and he could talk business all day. So that was just lucky, yeah. you know. And mum, who'd had the hands-on sort of cafe and hospitality experience, always helped. Um, uh, so she used to always come in and say, you know, pull me by the ear and say, you know, there's dirt over there, clean it up, the toilets, you know, all that yeah. sort of stuff that mothers do anyway, but, you know. <laughs> and that was just home. <laughs> That's just home, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah, um, and, yeah, and, and other friends, peers in the industry, people you meet along the way. One of the great things of having a cafe is 
people love your enthusiasm and feed off it and they genuinely want to help if you ask them. I found a, an amazing thing about the spirit of um, people. If, you know, you've got a business and you're really trying and they and if they've been in business before, they know you're working hard and they can see it. People share experience and, um, and knowledge and some, uh, on the way, which, is, which has been invaluable as well. Employees as well. It's one of the great things is, is um, things go like you employ people who bring so many different skills personalities and characters and um and reflection and friendship and support along the way you know it's um it's fun so just to round it off what's next for you through the pandemic and lockdown i i've always loved art drawing and painting but i never had the opportunity to use acrylics on canvas because i was always on the move kids and family so i got a i got a studio a house with a little little sunroom so i turned that into an art studio and so i've discovered that i love abstract oh. painting it's just so so much fun of which so I, instead of as i used to is you know draw a plane or a tree or a car now it, it's all abstract expressionism from your memory bank and what you're yeah. feeling at the time and what you so a lot of that you know coffee does come through there a lot of it so coffee's providing with a huge bank library of, uh, of creativity so while i have a bit of time not to be getting too entrepreneurial again right. i am um, Maybe I can sell a few more paintings. Thanks so much, Toby. Looking forward to our next conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait as well. So as a takeaway for me, these coffeepreneurs each showed that having teams around them are critical to their success, as well as the importance of looking forward, not back, and not dwelling in the past. And that's all this week for Fifth Wave Podcast. Please subscribe to Fifth Wave wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really appreciate a good rating if you enjoyed this show. And get in touch and tell us what topics are important to you so we can make the show more relevant to you and to your business. You can follow the link in the show notes to worldcoffeeportal.com slash fifth wave. This episode was recorded in the one and only Serendipity Studios in glorious Camden, North London. It was produced by myself, Jeffrey Young, the World Coffee Portal team, James Harper of Filter Productions, and sound engineering by Chris Bristow. And today, we leave you with Money Ain't a Thing from Chicago-based artist Roe and runner-up in the Coffee Music Project New York City 2016. Have a great week, and until next time, stay safe and stay caffeinated. Tell me how we get so high Tell me how we get so high Tell me how we get so high I did it once, I had to double up And level up like Wayne with that double cup DBM when I'm dressing up in fresh goods And I'm honest through the paint for the fresh bugs And now I'm seeing further than the giant can And all I really know is that I gotta win yeah. I've been putting in this work, whole thing about the change Hoping that this feeling stay the same I feel I'm going hard in the fast car, switching both flames Top down, screaming out, money ain't a thing Going hard in the fast car, switching both flames Top down, screaming out, money ain't a thing Going hard in the fast car, switching both flames Top down, screaming out, money ain't a thing Top down, screaming out, money ain't a thing Tell me how we get so high Tell me how we get so high Tell me how we get so high Tell me how we get so high